I was so enamored with the idea of a love bug. That cute little car could do so many different things. Disney has always been known for its animation, the way it's able to bring animated characters to life. Well, they did that with, with Herbie. Herbie had all the qualities of a great hero. He was sympathetic, he was loyal. He's perfect because he's cute. It's a little 40 horsepower tin can. I loved that car. It was like a friend. He had tenacity, he had heart. More than anything else, the show had heart. It's just a good, wholesome picture. It's pure Disney magic. It's a love story at heart on a very simplistic level. But I think the larger message is really not to take things and people for granted. It's really kind of a large message when you think about it. The only reference that Walt ever made to uh, the love bug, I had brought him a script, uh, and it was a, a story of the first sports car ever uh, brought to America. I had an option on it, and I said, this would be good for us to make. And uh, he said, uh, Dean, I read it, and he said, I, I, I've got a better car story for you. The love bugs were released in 69, but begun in, in a, about the time Walt was very, very sick and dying. I always connect that movie with that because what happened here when Walt died, for a period of time, there was a sort of a committee formed that, that was going to sort of oh, supervise the film business. And the idea was that we were going to send all of our scripts around to everybody else in the group and let everybody read what everybody was doing and get comments and hopefully profit from that. And during that time, um, I remember getting a script for The Love Bug from Bill Walsh, who was also the writer, and reading it and writing him a very long note about it, about the nature of fantasy. So I always felt sort of a personal pride, you know, in having contributed to it because I thought it was just a charming, delightful uh, film. The Love Bug is based on a story by Gordon Buford called Car Boy Girl. And Bill Walsh wrote it with Don DeGrotti. And they made a great team, Bill Walsh being words and Don DeGrotti being visual. The ideas, the jokes came from Bill. He had a great story mind. He had a delightfully funny look at life. We're talking about the same guy that did Mary Poppins, Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, The Shaggy Dog. The guy was a creative genius. Herbie wasn't always going to be a Volkswagen. They had trouble trying to find just the right car to play Herbie. They had a casting call for cars, maybe close to a dozen cars, lined up on the studio lot one day. They were going to cast the car. They had a Toyota, uh, a Fiat, a Volvo, an MG, and a Volkswagen. So they watched the employees as they were going to lunch to see how they reacted to them. Well, most people would walk up to the cars, you know, and they would kick the tires, reach in, and, you know, kind of move the steering wheel and see how it handles. But when they walked up to the Volkswagen, they just reached out and petted it as if it was like a friend. So that kind of eliminated the problem about who's going to play Herbie. They had their star. People would go buy it, and they would talk to it. You know, the crew members and the, the actors and stuff, and so baby Herbie, and they'd pet it, and, and it became a lie as we were making the picture. I loved that car. And when I talked to the car, when I touched the car, it was like a friend. It was an unpretentious car. It was a very real, I mean, it was just what you see is what you get. There's a kind of honesty there. It was kind of a throwaway car, but that's what works for the story. It's, I don't think it had more than 50 horsepower. It couldn't get out of its own way. But with all that, it had a certain charm. And nothing ever went wrong with them. And if something did go wrong with them, you got some oil and a rubber band and you put it back together again. Everybody thinks that the love bug was a natural title, but they, they wanted to go back to the original boy, girl, car. Then they experimented with the, the magic Volsi, if you can believe that, and Beetle Bomb. Finally, uh, Thunderbug. That was ludicrous, I think, for this nice, nice little car. I'm glad we didn't saddle him with a name like that. What'd I tell you? Now it handles good. All the bugs are gone. Herbie's all right. Who's Herbie? Now, how did Herbie get the name 
Bill Waltz, who was the producer, who is now dead, so I can really make up anything I want about him. Bill went to Las Vegas to see Buddy Hackett perform at the Sahara Hotel. In his act, he tells this story about the um, first time he went to go skiing, and the instructor's name was uh, Klaus, and Klaus said, uh, do you wish to ski? I said, well, not really. My wife, the one wants to ski. Well, we will teach you how to ski. I am Franz. I am the captain of the ski school, and this is Hans und Fritz. Who will you ski with? I said, if you ain't got a hobby, I ain't going. And so Bill Walsh thought that was hilarious, so that's how Herbie got his name. Herbie the Love Bug was, a, I was well, he was a beige kind of car, and he had a number, 53. How they came by 53, to this day I'll never know. It's just 53. <laughs> well, Bill Walsh um, said that while he was uh, uh, developing Herbie, that uh, he saw a lot of 53s on TV. Plus, if he was a baseball fan, the pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers was Don Drysdale, and that was his number, which is number 53. So that's how Herbie got his number. Robert Stevenson was a director, and The Love Bug was his 14th film with Disney. And of course, Robert Stevenson uh, directed Mary Poppins and That Darn Cat, Absent Minded Professor, and the list goes on. Bob was a very complex guy. He was brilliant, but Bob was very introvertish, which is unusual for a director. He was a very shy individual. Robert Stevenson brought great uh, attention to detail. Literally, frame by frame by frame, the love bug was storyboarded. He storyboarded everything with hundreds and hundreds of little pictures, giving every setup, every point of view of the camera, every detail accounted for, plus the fact that you have three different crews and all of this material has to come together and be seamlessly edited and make sense. And so improvisation was not a big part of this particular picture. If I were to criticize a man, I liked him very much. He got so involved with storyboarding, it became just a little too mechanical for me. I like to feel like I could move around a little bit. I always remember, you know, when we do a take, uh, he'd say, you see, all right, he said, uh, hey, Dean, uh, uh, give me another one exactly like that. And I'd say, Robert, if you want one exactly like that, why don't you print this one? And he'd say, no, what, what, just what, one more, one more, just, just like that, just like that. And it always amused me because uh, he didn't want to say, uh, you tripped up on something, or uh, gee, we had a very bad uh, uh, camera, whatever it was. He wouldn't mention the problem. He'd just say, we, we want another one exactly like that. Dean Jones had been sort of a favorite of Walt's. Talk about wonderful, dependable actors that really added a dimension to the written word. Dean Jones was, and is, not only a, a, a wonderful, dramatic actor, which he wasn't known for at the time, he was known to be a wonderful comic actor and he was really something to work with what's the rush tiger we got all night herbie took us to a drive-in help can you help me please when people look at the scene real close or maybe want to play it back they will notice that the hippie with the beard and glasses in the car next to us is really dean jones in makeup help i'm a prisoner we all prisoners, Chicky baby. We all locked in. <laughs> well, I, I doubt that very many people know that I played the hippie. I told Bill Walsh, I said, I'd like to play that hippie. And he said, well, you can't do that. You don't look. I said, OK. So Bob Schiffer, in charge of makeup that time for uh, Disney, put some appliances and beard and everything. And I walked right up and stood next to Bill Walsh. I don't know why I was, I was something, mumbling about something. And he looks over and, and he, he's kind of shocked because he'd never seen anything like that before. And uh, everybody is looking at me and nobody is recognizing me. And, uh, I, and I, I said, uh, well, uh, Mr. Walsh, I said, I'd like, 
I'd like to, I'd like to play the hippie. And then he realized, you know, and he said, I think you can do it. <laughs> so I got the role. <laughs> A couple of weirdos, Guinevere. Oh, I remember my introduction. Those great legs. There was a sign. I was standing behind the sign, and actually, I think I did shoot it. Maybe that was day one. That might have been day one of shooting, and I've always had good legs. <laughs> Carol Bennett was very attractive to me in those days because being that it was 1969, and this was a woman who really had her own mind, she held a job, and she spoke out, and she was bright. She was intuitive, and she was into cars. She was unlike the female that you would see in traditional films at that time. I wasn't thrilled with the helmet because it didn't do anything for my eyes. There's no question in my mind that Michelle Lee is one of the most talented actresses in the country, and underrated actress. They gave me several helmets, let's say. Pick the helmet that you really like. And I said to them, I don't like any of the helmets because it makes me look like I'm wearing a helmet. In a scene with Michelle, there was always energy. There was always that life. I mean, you could look into her eyes and get something back that would energize and animate you for the scene. You know, your helmet down to here, right? Now, I had to have some of my bangs. You'll notice in the movie, they put something inside so that I could have just a little bit of hair around me. You'll see, I did that. They allowed me to do that. This was in the very beginning of my career and I was just eating up everything around me. You know, I would watch all the actors and I was learning what was happening on, on set. Watching David Tomlinson was like watching a comic genius and it was always so truthful that it didn't matter whether it was funny or not. It was always right. David Tomlinson, I mean, a unique actor, uh, understated Englishman, and yet he had this, uh, this uh, outlandish vaudevillian uh, over-the-top sense of humor. So the, the juxtaposition of those two things and his personality made for very interesting punchlines or straight lines. Mm, you know something about champagne, sir? <laughs> Have a sure. If you tell me that the bubbles tickle your nose, I shall probably kill you! Have you gone mad? Get Mr. Douglas and his acquisition out of here before I lose my temper! He was always being abused and squirted with oil. What the... If somebody was doing something that was inappropriate, he'd make sure that they were politely liquefied. <laughs> that was my favorite part of the picture. See, he insulted the car. Are you crazy? You're gonna stop me for tears? <laughs> anyway, the car just picked up the tire like a dog and just let a stream of oil onto his foot. It was very, very uh, racy for those days, you know. I just remember one day we did a scene where we opened the glove compartment and there was David Tomlinson's face <laughs> scrunched up in that glove compartment. Get me out of here! And I remember that day shooting. We could not look at him. He was, we kept laughing. He's got one of those rubber faces. His eyebrows, his mouth, his nose, everything is so animated. He was such a gift. He was, and he was incredible in this film. What part of Ireland did you say your mother came from? Coney Island. <laughs> Betty Hackett was <laughs> completely out of the blue, and I think, uh, you know, one of the great choices. <laughs> he was outlandish all of the time. Just incredibly silly things that, that we would do that, that, were, that were funny. <laughs> Buddy Hackett had this unbridled energy and a mind that wouldn't stop. You don't let Buddy Hackett improv. He does it whether you like it or not. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, Robin Williams, you know? It's like when you've got that mind that's so out there and you can't really stop it. It's part of the process. 
It's not that he wouldn't do, he would do what was written. It's just that he had this joyous, wonderful look at life and the way he would entertain, and he'd love to make people laugh. I mean, that was part of what Buddy Hackett did and does. And so we would have many, many laughs with him on the set. I always had a feeling Herbie was a cast member. He was uh, one of the stars along with Dean Jones, David Tomlinson, and Michelle Lee. Do you remember when that little music comes on? You know, Herbie's on scene. That kind of set his personality. Herbie sort of was this little guy with his uh, own agenda, you know, and the first part of it was to prove that he was somebody. He's perfect because he's cute. Herbie's cute, he's little, he, and it does look like Herbie has two eyes, because remember those wonderful windows that looks like two eyes, and a big, wonderful, soft, round face. Herbie had, had all the qualities of a, of a great hero. He was sympathetic, he was loyal to Jim. He had tenacity, he had heart. You know, you don't hear about heart so much today. The script was written in such a way that you knew exactly what Herbie was doing. He was a character. He was a character. Herbie was very frightened as he approached the freeway from the ramp. Herbie looked up at all the big cars and the huge trucks before him whizzing by and was very afraid to approach. He was very shy. And as a parent would tell his child, you have to look both ways, Herbie was in that moment. And Herbie was described so in the script, in the stage direction, as being so. What's the matter? Are you from L.A. or something? Herbie, to me, is, is like a child. He's a child that wants to be adopted. And uh, Jim, Dean Jones' character, stood up for him in the car dealership. And Herbie was blown away by that. So uh, that's why he followed him home and said, he's going to be my, my master. Like most little boys, he didn't like to get beaten by anybody. He's a classic character out of a movie about a little kid growing up, I guess, as much as anything. And you just change that into a car and let him do all the things a little kid would have done, including running away from home and trying to commit suicide. Herbie? That scene where Herbie tries to commit suicide was the first scene we shot in the movie. They couldn't get the car to react properly on the railing of the Golden Gate Bridge. And they said, Dean, can, can we get a close-up of you while we're trying to get this thing to operate? So the first shot in the movie was me saying, Herbie, no. And, and Robert, Robert Stevenson, the director, felt obligated to explain the scene to me. So he's, you know, he says, well, you see, Dean, you see, you see Herbie is very, very hurt that you've gotten a Lamborghini. And said, he's, he's very, very jealous, and he's, he's been injured. His feelings have been injured. And I'm saying, oh, OK, OK. Now, I'm not into this yet. I mean, it's early on a Monday morning, and we haven't gotten the idea that this car is a, a personality yet. And I'm saying, okay, and he says, when you see him there try, trying, to, trying to commit suicide, you, 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 you say, Herbie, no, and you've got all of the passion and all of it. And I kept cracking up. They'd say, roll camera, I would start laughing. And this happened about three times, very unprofessionally, but I finally got it. No, Herbie, don't! But uh, it was quite difficult to imagine Herbie's feelings on that first morning, I must tell you. <laughs> on this show, which is not always the case, we shot the second unit first. The second unit is a unit usually devoid of actors, you stunt people, it's action stuff. Scenics, run-bys, and Art Villarelli was in my estimation, probably the best the second unit director ever. Stevenson and Walsh would put something down on paper and they'd throw it to Art to figure out how to do it. Well, he always did. We had to create special effects. They were on camera. They were live. Today, a lot of this could have been done with computers. That's the easy way. We never had that luxury. There were eight. Herbie's in the original Love Buck because there were so many different gags in the picture. To do that show, you had more than one Herbie. You had about a half a dozen of them, maybe nine. And they were parked everywhere throughout the studio, and, and the employees would 
very often clamor over them and sit in them and climb on them to have their picture taken because they were part of what they thought at the time was studio history. Each one was rigged to do a special gag. Like when Buddy Hackett is hanging on the door and they're going over the cliff and the car's on two wheels. Well, that was a specially rigged automobile. When it gets cut in half and both pieces of the car goes across the line ahead of Tomlinson's, that was another rigged car. We had a souped up fast Herbie. We had a hydraulic Herbie that would do wheelies. One Herbie had the ability to shudder and shake. We had one car that in Herbie, the wheels all wobbled. It was sick after it had the Irish coffee. And then we had uh, the feature picture car who, who couldn't do anything but look pretty. And we had backups to all those cars. And these cars, of course, had to come apart. You had to take doors off. You had to take windshields out. You had to pull backs off, fronts off, so that you can shoot the back seat, the front seat. So it was quite a chore to go out to the junkyards and find pieces and parts for the film. There's a scene where Jim Douglas gets onto the trolley car in San Francisco, and Herbie is behind the trolley car, so he, he's driving up the hill. If you look in the left rear view window, you can be able to see the driver's head, and uh, you'd never pick up on it. I thought that was very cool. Herbie driving by himself, which is pretty much what he did a lot of the time, was accomplished by what we call blind driver, which means that we have to rig the car with a extended steering wheel to the back seat, extended control for brake and throttle to the back seat. You put a stunt driver behind the upholstery He's actually steering the car from the back seat, and Herbie appears to be steering by himself. The first wheelie, for instance, was a cable on the front of the car and a huge crane hovering over us, and the crane pulled the front of the car off the ground. I mean, these seem like primitive special effects today, but that's the way we did them. Other things were, were put together like a jigsaw puzzle. Herbie jumping into the tree is done in about four pieces. We actually took a car and jumped it off of a dirt road, and it went through the air. We picked up that piece. Then the next time, we picked it up and overlapped that with a crane with the car on wires. They kind of scuffled in the tree, and you saw a couple of stunt people coming down out of the tree. And then you saw the car change its attitude, and it kind of wound itself down through the tree. We couldn't hurt the trees because it was at Golden Oaks Ranch, and so we had to kind of maneuver the car through the tree to not hurt the tree, not worry about the shot. Anyway, as they came out on the ground, the stunt people hit the ground, and they, uh, the actors came in, laid on the ground in the same place. They jumped up, and we finished lowering the car down. That's how we did that shot. I recall when uh, when uh, they, they said they're going to skip Herbie across the lake. I said, well, how are you going to do this, guys? They kept telling you, well, just make it look like a rock skipping across the water. Well, a car is not a rock skipping across the water. In special effects, there's no word in the vocabulary that says it's impossible. So we never said no. Never. Herbie skipping across the pond was done out at the Disney Golden Oak Ranch. We went out there and set up big telephone poles in the ground to use for anchors for our rigging. The rigging was cables overhead out of picture and we put a traveler and we put motors to travel the car across at a certain speed then they put a full-sized volkswagen this was the days you, you're, we're not talking computer generated here this is full-size stuff that we have to work with so we had to make a car very very light we had to put a bottom in it so that it couldn't what we call catch the water and we would lift with the counterweight the car off the water dropping back Pick him up, let him down, and all the time we're traveling forward. The cable had a belly in it because of the long distance. And so each time it went down, we kind of had to do a visual on it so that it just barely touched the water, because if it ever got in the water, it would just stop it and start swinging. So it was a little bit touchy to trigger that just right. And uh, we finally got it. I imagine we did it 25, 30 times. They had taken weeks to shoot it, literally weeks. And it was four seconds, you know, three, four seconds. And there was a crew out there doing 
That's and this was incredible. I, I couldn't believe that. You know, Art Vitarelli, that's why I just I have to commend him because he had the patience that was unbelievable. What was necessary to get those shots? He would just do them. Okay, I know we got close that time. Let's try it again. And they had an artist go in and paint the wires for whatever was behind it. So if it was a blue sky, if it was a tree, whatever it was, that when it went down for the shot, you wouldn't be able to tell there's any wires on Herbie. That's why it's so believable in publicity. They got Herbie right as he was skimming across the water. Well, of course, they didn't have any live people in the car. You believe that there are, but, but they had uh, stunt dummies. So in the lobby set, they had this big 11 by 17 picture, and you see these stunt dummies with helmets on just kind of leaning up against the, uh, the windshield. <laughs> it's very funny. We'll be running on three wheels, which is quite a little trick but it was done by mounting a big hydraulic cylinder within the car out of frame. And on cue, we could start to elevate that leg, or drop it, I should say, with a hydraulic control and lift the car right up. And we had balanced out the car, and we could actually go down the road with it driving on two wheels. We have to lock off the brake on one side so that you don't lose the drive of the rear end. There was a mistake that um, the second unit team forgot to include on Herbie. And it took me years to even notice this. The door that Tennessee is setting on to balance Herbie is missing the 53 racing number. That image was used in the lobby card set. It was used on the front cover of books, video, front cover of the laser disc. Sure enough, the 53 is missing. The missing 53. There was only one effect shot that we didn't use in the picture, or they didn't use in the picture. And it was like a dog shaking water off of its back. And we got it all done. And they looked at it and they accepted it. And it was really funny. It was a, one of the funniest things. It didn't work for them. And I don't remember why, whether they didn't have the time for it or whatever, but it was really neat to see a Volkswagen shake like a dog that was all wet and trying to get the water off of them. Hang tight. This may be a fast takeoff. Now. When we had to show acceleration or speed, we made a couple of modified Volkswagens. We used Porsche engine, Porsche brakes, Porsche wheels, Porsche tires. So there's a lot of difference between a standard Volkswagen and what you could do with a Herbie after we got through with it. It still looked innocent and unpretentious, but it was very fast. You could get it up to 150, 120. But in order to stop the car, the brakes weren't strong enough. You had to open the doors. And that was dangerous because nobody was holding the wheel. What about it, Dad? Want to give that doodle bug a workout? I'll go easy on you. Be serious, will you? I drove it home one day, and uh, at a stoplight, there was a Corvette. And uh, he's looking at me, and I just look at him. And when, when it turned green, I just floorboarded it, just gave it everything it had. And it took the guy by surprise, of course. He thought this was no contest. And uh, by, the, by the, next, the next traffic light, which was quite a ways down, uh, he pulled up with a little more respect for Volkswagen. <laughs> Out of sight, man. I wouldn't have believed it. Groovy, Pop, groovy. To make Herbie look like he was going fast, we also would put dust or leaves on the road, and as a car would go through it, it gave the illusion of speed. Each morning early, I would come in and help Max Belchowski, the stunt driver who drove that. He's dead now, too, so I could tell you anything you want about Max. Anyway, we'd come in early in the morning and put a brand new clutch in. Every day it had a new clutch that we were gonna race the car, because if you burn the clutch, then you got 132 people standing around doing nothing while you got to change it. Most of the big effects that you see were done with stunt people in stunt vehicles and on race tracks. We were actually at Riverside, actually in the race. It was very funny how that was accomplished because Herbie was allowed to start in an actual race. And these were race cars. I mean, they went so far away from this Volkswagen. But the Volkswagen was so far back, whenever we get a shot of him, it looks like he was in the front. <laughs> he didn't realize that these guys were coming around. They were about to lap him. 
A good part of the shots were very dangerous because you are working at speeds. You are working amongst other cars. They're not all stunt people that were driving those cars. A lot of them are the drivers of those cars, and they're race car drivers. So they don't know when to move and which way to move all the time. And uh, so there was a lot of danger. The number one stunt driver on the show was a very famous guy by the name of Kerry Lofton. He doubled Dean in any of the fast car stuff, the weaving in and out, all the stuff up in the mountains, the bouncing across country, the skip over the lake. Kerry did all of it. And he was the best. At one point, we had Max Polchowski hanging out on the door with the door open, going over the edge of the cliff, and Kerry Lofton driving. Those shots, probably the most dangerous shots in, in the show, because we shot that sequence up in Angeles Crest. And uh, our stunt people were actually riding on the edge of that cliff in a very unstable car, and they're going quite fast. That was pretty dicey stuff we did up there. The stunt people really earned their pay. We talked to Art Vitarelli and said, we've got to put some limitations on some of the requests, some of these storyboards that you have. We just can't do this and do it safely or, or repeat it. And it'll cost you a car or it cost somebody getting hurt. Or, and then we'd go back to the, kind of the drawing board and they'd compromise a little bit. and uh, We'd get as close as we could as to what they wanted. And again, we'd go back to Mr. Stevens with the, with the film and he would either yay or nay. And um, that's kind of what we had to do coming down the mountain of Big Bear, and the mountain is covered with pine needles. You can't hardly walk down it. At the end of that hill was a drop-off down to the road of 40, 50 feet. Kerry said, you know, I never do anything that I can't do twice. And he would come down the hill and come back up again and have a smile on his face. He said, well, we got that one. Kerry Lofton is one of the funniest men that ever walked the face of this earth, and probably one of the most talented. He had a tremendous sense of humor. But he was a wild man. He was completely out of his mind, and I think that's what it takes to be a stunt driver anyhow in the film business. But what would happen from time to time is you'd get caught out on the road. I'd be holding traffic, and Harry would come by in the souped-up Porsche slash Volkswagen and say, well, I'll drive you back to the, uh, the company. Well, it was the most hair-raising ride of your life. I mean, you would be up on an Angelus Crest and you'd have this, this car hanging out over the, the cliff and I'm screaming like a baby, you know. And I fell for it twice. He got me twice. And uh, the third time he couldn't get me. I said, I'm gonna walk the, the mile back. I'm not getting in that car with you again. Ah! I can't well back! In the picture, Herbie had to do so many different things as you know, split apart at the end. What had to happen to make this all be possible, we had to split the car to begin with in two halves. We then connected the two halves with a long tube. We were able to slide those two apart, which showed the car coming apart. And so we were able to pull the front end away from the back end. And we had kind of a parallelogram staring in it. We could actually make the car go way to one side and back to the other side. Of course, later on, the thing split in two totally. So you had two different mechanisms. We put a motor in the front half, and we put a rear wheel under that tower, and we put another wheel under the rear half at the front of the tower. Driving the back half of the Volkswagen, I, I would say, is probably a little bit scary. You're looking right at the ground, and you know there's nothing in front of you that's protecting you. And you're going along at a fair clip, which is probably 40, 40 miles an hour. And uh, so you do think about that. And we put a hydraulic steering in it, which is very quick, because you had to have your hands up on the roll bar like you were hanging on. And uh, so you had to have the steering from up there. It was very unstable. They had to undercrank to, to give the uh, impression of speed in that particular scene because uh, we, we couldn't go very fast without turning those little uh, dudes over. Stuntman flipped it over several times as he was doing the requirements of what he had to do on the racetrack there. Art Vitterelli was saying, you have to go five miles an hour faster because the sink between the cars, the race cars, and the half of the Volkswagen was too close. They had to go five miles an hour faster so he could make it look like he's really going through the pack. And Kerry, I remember his words, he, Art, I don't think we should do that. And Art says, I just got to have that. And so the next thing was, is, uh, Kerry was upside down in the rear half, and we all ran over to him. And uh, that was my responsibility, was the safety end of it, and to get him out and if he was hurt and whatever we needed to do. 
So we ran over to him, and Kerry's upside down, and kind of red, and he looked at Art and said, Art, I don't think we can go five miles an hour faster. No more shortcuts like that last one, Jim. Oh, this won't be anything like that last one. I think the, the most surprising part of the visual effects was the mat work, that whole sequence where Herbie was running away to kill himself. I mean, it looks so real. Even those wide shots, the mat shots of the firehouse in San Francisco, part of it was drawn and part of it was, was there and, and real. We built a section of the Golden Gate Bridge, the railing, uh, the walk, and a little piece of the street. And if you remember, that was kind of fogged in. And so we put a chroma key blue backing behind. And on that, this is where we put in the ocean and all of the necessary parts of the bridge. For me, I had a, a tough time until I saw the finished product believing they were going to be able to bring this off. Well, it looked a lot more real than our shots inside the car, for instance, which looked kind of phony by today's standards. Dean Jones and Michelle Lee, they never went out driving. We just had half a Volkswagen <laughs> on the stage three at the studio. It's a visual sleight of hand. You put a car in front of a screen, and later on, you put in a, what we call a background plate, a moving plate, a scene that is shot from the camera car to give the object car in the foreground on the stage motion when you put the two together. In order to get the bumps and the movements of the car, we built special gimbals manipulated by us off camera, by hand, lever bars, maybe even mechanical devices that make the car turn, roll, skid, whatever the action may be. So we'd put the actors and the actresses in the, those cars with fans blowing, and we'd have some dust blowing by them and sometimes debris, and we would create that same look. And again, against sodium, and then they would put the background of the racetrack into it. We built a pair of tracks, or sometimes three tracks, going across the stage. We would put each one of the race cars on top of this chassis that we built and we could actually make the cars go back and forth and then one would turn or curve or spin out and we could actually control each of those cars on the stage. They would just sit in the car and uh, turn to each other and chat or whatever and pretend like they were driving. And we would get the giggles because we were asked to do so many extraordinary things as actors. Mr. Stevenson would say, Okay, everybody, imagine you're skipping across the body of water. Some of my other direction was, Michelle, look to the right. What you see is, fill in the blank. Jim, that's water! Michelle, could you keep your head up? Okay, now look surprised. Okay, now look scared. Now look amazed. <laughs> Because everything was the imagination. So much of it was the imagination. People would tell us what we were seeing, and we never saw it. I remember Dean Jones, he just drove like crazy. And finally had to just almost tie his hands stationary, because going down a straight road, you don't do all of this. <laughs> you just barely turn. I remember the race at the end, the car separated. And that was great fun. They actually separated the car, and we were actually driving it that day. We ended up in one half of the car, and we actually shot that outside on location. That was not on the set. Let's go, Herbie. The world premiere for The Love Bug was at the Grauman's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, on Hollywood Boulevard. Boy, I wish I could have been there. It was great because the invitations were sent out saying that if you did not show up in a VW, you would not have valet parking. So you can imagine there were Volkswagens all over Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, you were encouraged to wear your funkiest 60s attire, no pun intended. There's a shot of Dean Jones, Michelle Lee, and Buddy Hackett, and they are wearing these crazy outfits. It's great, it's great. At the premiere, I remember they made me a special gown while we were shooting. I think I got my test back from my doctor that I was pregnant. I was probably out to here. I was so pregnant. I mean, how do you beat that? How do you beat that? 
And how do you beat going to the Grauman's Chinese, where all those wonderful fingerprints are in front, and walking in and seeing this humongous screen with images of this magical car? It's, it's quite extraordinary. There was some pretty terrific stuff that they cut together. And we knew it was going to be a good family film. We knew it was going to be a fun picture, uh, humorous. Those of us who worked on the show knew we had something special. I mean, I, I think everybody thought this was one of the best shows in years. But nobody could ever be prepared for the way the show was received. We didn't have a clue. <laughs> we didn't know. I mean, when the grosses started coming in for the love, I, I mean, we were all shocked couldn't believe it. I mean, uh, who could have anticipated the show would become the biggest grossing show of 1969? And 69 was a particularly good year for future pictures. Midnight Cowboy, uh, uh, Butch Cassidy, Sundance Kid, and yet uh, Herbie uh, outstripped them all. The second biggest box office grocer after Mary Poppins uh, in the studio's history. Go on. I didn't get to see it for quite a while after it came out. I was on another picture in Mexico. And uh, when I got back, uh, my wife had taken our children to see The Love Bug. And, and they, they talked about it for a year. They fell in love with Herbie. And the neighbors, they went on and on and on. So many people or friends of mine who have nieces, nephews, or sometimes children come to me today because they see the film. And I treasure that. I really do because it is something that can go from generation to generation is wonderful for the whole family. Herbie was a car for all seasons, you know, was a car for all peoples. I just wish that, that Walt had, had lived to, to see the success of that film. I, I, can't, I can't explain it, except uh, that there's a, a sympathy for this charming little automobile who was so loyal who uh, had such tenacity, such heart, and uh, kids today. They still, they still love, love that Volkswagen. A kid came up to me, I was back east uh, in a speaking engagement, and this kid looked up and said, you were in the love bug? And I said, yes, yes I was. And he said, you got old. This must be Disney. This is the first time I've ever had coffee without tequila in it. <laughs> you better, you better, will you stop that? Now, I, I know you're a terrific makeup person, but you don't have to have a whole career on my face. That's my imitation of Herbie in the drunk scene. This isn't scripted. You can't pick up where you were and do it again. Shall we do it once more? Do what? I don't know what I said. I don't even know how I got here. How did I get involved with the love bug? Um, it bit me. This is the makeup artist. And then they want tears not to come to my eyes. When you look at her and you know she's going to touch your face twice and leave, of course you cry. <laughs> don't kiss me, I have a cold. You are so darn cute. <laughs> <laughs>